I think there are three things that I'd like to emphasize in terms of what uh, the United States government has done to contribute uh, to the IGF. And there are three. Uh, one, uh, we were there at its beginning, and we were its uh, first supporter. Uh, secondly, uh, we have continued to support the IGF. Ambassador Gross has been at three of these uh, meetings, and Ambassador Revere will be in Sharm el-Sheikh. So the State Department's record in that regard is very well established. And uh, we will continue to support the existence of the IGF. And I'll come back on this. And then, and then third point is participation. Uh, the government uh, has continued to participate at every level of the IGF, uh, and um, that, I think, uh, is indicative of our uh, view of the IGF. On the origins, it's, it's important to remember, and I, as I often do when asked to participate on panels such as this, I try to go back to the beginning and find out what we said uh, when we created the IGF. And then I have to say, uh, as I look at paragraph 72 of the Tunis Agreement, it's rather remarkable uh, how strong that original uh, terms of reference uh, was and uh, continu continues to be, it seems to me, the the enduring purpose uh, for the IGF. And key words are to promote discussion, to, uh, to facilitate discourse, to promote interface with various groups, to facilitate exchange of information, to advise all stakeholders, to strengthen and enhance engagement, identify emerging issues, contribute to capacity building, promote and access, uh, access, access. All of these terms which uh, were used in those uh, late night sessions uh, in uh, Tunis have endured and it seems to me uh, continue to do so and, and I would underscore uh, that the U.S. delegation working with a rather remarkable individual, Ambassador Masood Khan, uh, uh, created it seems to me the basis for the IGF in, the, in those sessions in Tunis and for that I think uh, uh, the United States government is owed um, a congratulatory uh, uh, appreciation. It really is different from other internet conferences or that I go to and, and other panels because usually you're either there to learn or there to represent an interest and really here the key is participation and I think it's participation at the individual level that you can go there, you can be on a workshop and you can talk to people during the conference I think people go there with an expectation that they are not just there to receive information or to represent a position, but to actually participate. Uh, and then I think the deeper interesting uh, phenomenon that's happening from that is a, a sense of community is starting to develop. And when you go to a place like East Africa and really uh, see how they feel now as part of the international community, and the theme of the conference was think globally and act locally, and they really take that seriously and they followed the same issues um, that, um, that the global IGF has, but they applied it to their own issues and their own challenges. And I think it's great to see that happening here in the U.S. And I've, I've met some new uh, folks today that are part of the community that it, you know um, were right here in Washington that hadn't met before. So I think this could be the continuation, uh, um, as Robert Garrow said, you know, we should be talking more just here locally. Everyone is fairly happy across the board, across all sectors, developed and developing countries, with the discussions in the forum, with the dialogue that's been um, encouraged, and also with the with the consultative um, consultative status, the the way the organization works as well. Um, from a lot of the developing countries, you do see an emphasis on remote participation. 36% um, of the respondents cited this as a, a concern for increasing participation. Um, civil society groups also, 37% of respondents mentioned remote participation as a concern as well. The IGF has evolved. Uh, I had the, the, maybe the dubious distinction of being uh, one of the panelists on the first session of the first IGF, a, a panel on openness which was obviously something that a company like Cisco, who's promoting free flow of information, would love to be on, right? Uh, and, and I had lots of good things to talk about, and, uh, but unfortunately, from my, my perspective, there were lots of challenges. Let me leave it at that. And those of you who were there will understand that. Uh, but, but I was pleased 
that I had an opportunity because the nature of the discussion was one that gave me an opportunity to make my case. As make my case without a resolution. No one had to decide at the end of the day was I right or wrong, but I had a chance to talk and give my perspective on this uh, over a course of an hour and a half. That uh, in, in a very, very, uh, at that time it was very intense, uh, somewhat accusatory, but that process has matured dramatically over the last few years. And so at this last uh, IGF in Hyderabad, we found ourselves in a situation in which there was a much more, it was a frank and candid discussion, uh, and has been pointed out many times, uh, the first IGF, there were kind of things that we said, well, let's talk about these four things and everything else is off the table. Now that process has evolved so that uh, it's been a learning experience and now any issue is on the table and it can be dealt with frankly and honestly. And the fact that there is no uh, decision making and no negotiated text means I don't have to worry at the end of the day as to what is that sentence going to be that describes that discussion. And we're not going to spend, you know, a half an hour or an hour figuring out what that is. So you have uh, the opportunity for having a very frank discussion, open, any subject, and the course of the last several years with the strong participation of business, civil society, international organizations, the internet community, et cetera, governments, we, we've developed relationships across those various uh, stakeholder groups that are very constructive for that discussion going forward. So that, that's very important. And the last point I would, I would again go back to this multi-stakeholder advisory group. That is a very unique uh, structure that has been put in place to, to plan this and to put a tremendous amount of uh, energy into making that, that work. And they really have, uh, have not been set in stone in terms of the vision of the IGF. And so each one has been very carefully modified to reflect the feedback that's been given, and they're really interested in the success of this, and I think that's been a critical feature of its success. So uh, let me get, uh, and, the, and the final point I would make is the, uh, it's been valuable from our perspective because the fact that it's, you know, flattery or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And so the fact that we see IGFs here today, other parts of the world, I think reflect the fact that not only Cisco and the business community but others around the world see that this really takes discussions at a national level. And so I, it's very important to me in terms of emulating and replicating this model uh, and, uh, and therefore looking at policy issues and what can be done to make a more inclusive Internet around the world.